Yes. Good. Okay, so as you know, I'm John Cassidy. This is me. This is me about to lose. Uh, it's not actually a role playing game, which you think, you know, we're talking about role playing games and developing role playing culture, but Letters from Whitechapel, the game I'm about to lose um, really? here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is is a great example of uh, a board game that you can play if you have an interest in uh, role playing dimensions, right? Because the the player uh, that I was playing with, Jack, Jack the Ripper, right? Letters from Whitechapel is a simulation of the police hunt for Jack the Ripper. So you have a Jack character, then you have the police characters, right? Um, and uh, it's a dynamite game. Uh, Tracy you know, and I have played it a number of times. Super possible. Um, when you're on both sides. So, uh, you know, uh, today's topic is really about culture in role-playing games. Okay. How to build cultures that make sense internally and that will help your players make decisions in games that make sense. Okay. Uh, this is a quote that has been, you know, on my mind for a long time. Because how many of you just read? You know, you ever read just role playing game books just for the sake of reading role playing game? I mean, I do, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're like me, you read them and you're wondering where the 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 culture sections are. You know, what what do these people eat? What do they read? What, why do they think the way that they? How do they deal with outsiders, strangers? How do they deal with the stranger, you know, in, inside? I don't really want to know as much why I should care whether someone's carrying eight pounds or ten in their backpack. That doesn't really interest me as much as cultural questions. That you never get the answers you want to, okay? at least in my experience. So, uh, Tony Morrison. Famous American author, if this book you want to read hasn't been written, you write it, which is what I did. Um, what we're going to talk about today, you'll find in greater detail when it's published, should be published this year, in a book called Folkways, um, published for a role playing game called Harp. It's, uh, it's a condensed version of an old role playing game called Rollmaster, which I loved. Um, so I have a relationship with those guys. They said at some point, We'd like you to write a book for us. What do you want to write? And I said, I'd like to write a book about developing meaningful cultures. Here's what I think it should look like. He said, write it. And so what I'm going to take you through today is that. Okay. Because ultimately, what you want are characters that can enter a new place and have some kind of grounding, some kind of understanding of themselves that will help them make sense of wherever they are. As a, as a person would, not as a set of numbers would. Do you understand what I mean when I'm, when I'm, try, what I'm trying to get at, right? It's the, it's the hammer problem, right? If all you think you are is your strength and your dexterity and your intelligence, then all you're looking for is puzzles and problems, right? When, in my experience, the very best and most exciting and interesting role-playing game session go a long time between the roll of a die and the next roll of a die, because what you're doing is trying to figure out where you are, what the context is, why where you are, it works the way that it does. Um, characters without their own cultural framework, they have no basis on which to interact with anything, they don't know why do what they do. They have to have their own setting first. Yeah. So that's what we want. Okay, so look, if you are going to do this work effectively, you have to see yourself as an anthropologist. Anyone study anthropology in school? No? Anyone? Anthropology? No. Um, so Clifford Geertz, uh, one of the most important 21st, 20th century uh, anthropologists, said, man is an animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun. I take culture to be those webs. Does that make sense? If you think about some some ways in which American culture webs together, think about, think about any aspect of American culture. Just throw something out. 
baseball, okay? What kind of a sport, how does baseball function as a sport, as a player, okay? How does it, how does it reflect American values? Uh, family relations. 
big, big families, okay? And everyone seems to know everyone else, right? right? You remember Bilbo at his going away party, he's calling out, uh, 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 you know, pro, uh, Proudfoot. Proudfoot's proud feet, right? You know, that kind of, everyone knows everyone else. Well, that's one way to do a community. It's not the only way, okay? What is the relationship of Frodo to Sam? Sam is his gardener. A friend. Friend. Yeah. Okay. Gardener. Authority. Rank. Frodo is higher. In a society without a king or any discernible government, this is a mayor. No procedure in Appendix Y that says how the mayor of the Shire is elected, right? You know that Sam is the servant, and Frodo is the master. Mr. Frodo, Mr. Frodo, instead of Mr. Sam, right? Why? Well, you don't need to know why. You just know that it is, and you can put yourself together. Oh, it makes sense. Okay? They have this kind of scheme. That's how it works, okay? What do they like to eat? What don't they like to eat, right? There are people who like life, right? They're not, they're, you know, interested in adventures. Well, yeah, the adventure is getting up and going to the larder to get a pie for 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 elevensies, right? I don't think I know about second breakfast, Pip. Right? I mean, you know what you need to know about these people: pastoral, rural. They live in small communities. Everyone knows everyone else. They like to eat. They choose to live in this kind of a dwelling. Sometimes, some of them live in above above ground, right? So there's probably more money in these houses, right? How's she different? <laughs> Cheers. Queen is a monarchy. Yeah, she's a queen, right? And you know it from before you've even arrived, right? That she is not someone to be trifled with, okay? Because she's already can't go in there. Good grief. Right? It has she's there, right? But what about elf culture? More formal. Way more. Right? What else? <laughs> Extremely long lived. And their perspective as a result is totally screwy to us. At least in my perspective. They have a whole way of looking at the world that doesn't really, it just seems a little abstracted maybe, or why would, you, why would you choose to, why do you do anything the way that you, why do you do what you do? Why would you choose any of these decisions? The world is coming apart and the elves are just sort of in a leisurely departure. They're not fleeing. They're not fighting. They just sort of, I guess our time is up. It's the time, it's time for someone else. Okay. Their culture is unbelievably old. There aren't that many of them, really. Right? And their days, their days are past. Okay? They perceive themselves as being a people whose time is past. Hobbits don't. They don't see themselves in that, in that way. Think about any of the television, film, uh, uh, or, or book cultures that you've read that are not Earth cultures. And you'll find that the authors, if they've done a good job, have given you just enough to make sense of how the cultural pieces fit together. And then you get your story. Okay. All of that stuff they're doing at the beginning that seems to the point of any of this. It's to situate the character so that when they make a decision, makes sense. If you don't believe what they do, the whole story falls apart. Make sense? So, <clears throat> now we're in the meat. And here's why you, you need your you need your paper. Okay. I'm going to go through 19 of the 20 folk ways that I've written about in the book. Okay? What you need in order to build authentic cultures are answers 
each of these questions. You could write endless thousands of words, or you could just have a sketch. You don't need a lot, but you need something. Okay? Uh, if you want to get a sense of what this looks like in the American context, okay, there's a historian. I'll write his name up on the, on the board at the end. His name is David Hackett Fisher. Okay? He wrote a book called Albion's Seed. I'll write it up there. Um, which basically, the intellectual framework of this work originates in his book. Okay? He has a lot more of these. He mashes it together there. But if you have an interest in reading a piece of anthropological American history that looks at uh, New Englanders, Virginians, Pennsylvanians, and then people who live out here in the Appalachian area, how the four of those groups together formed an American whole. That's what it's about. Okay. So, 20 vocals. First one, the environment. Okay. Now, you think about the ways in which environment shapes culture. And in some, in some ways, it's, it's, it's everything. Think about, think about the, where the hobbits live. The Shire is lovely, right? Mild and temperate, trees but not too many, not jungle, forest, okay? Well watered, plenty of rain but not too much, no evidence of cataclysmic storms, right? This river is the Nile one of the four great rivers of the ancient world, the most peaceful. No great surprise that it led to the creation of the most orderly and powerful government in the ancient world, that of Egypt. Egypt's gods are, behave themselves. They act according to rules and laws and principles just like the Nile does. Okay? They're not arbitrary. Kind of people generally. The Tigris and Euphrates in Mesopotamia, totally unreliable rivers, they flood catastrophically. Um, you know, once a decade, when they do, they take whole cities down the river with them. Mesopotamia's gods are angry, vengeful, frightening entities. My argument, just the river. Okay. So now think about a culture. Think about a culture that you want to build. And think about its water. Where does it get it? How much does it have? Does it have too much? Does it have too little? Does it have just enough? Does it come from a lake? Does it come from a pond? Is it from the ocean? And they have some sort of magical technology to turn salt water into fresh? Do they have a glacier? Do they live under a glacier? Do they live on a glacier? Right? If you have no water, you're done. So you have to move. Okay? So if your answer is, we don't have any regular water, you've made huge decisions about your culture. They have to move constantly to find it, okay? No. Or, Dune, right? If you've seen or read Dune, right? You have to shepherd it, husband it, right? And hide it, because there's nothing more precious, except for the spice of knowledge, of course, right? So, have you written it down? Just a sentence. Where does the water come from? Who owns it? Anyone? Is it abundant or scarce? Is it all fresh? Is it fresh sometimes, salt otherwise? That can happen. Do your people live in a marsh? Two, villages, towns, cities. How do they build them? What do they build with? What does the built environment look like? How do people move in it? European cities, small and crabby, right? Everyone's all on top of each other. Cities in Mexico, ancient cities in Mexico. Huge, wide open boulevards, 
right, with these gigantic pyramids, right, that mark the power of the state everywhere. Everywhere you go, the state is looking down on them, right? In medieval European cities, you could barely, you could barely find you know, your way to the nearest gate, let alone find any evidence of, of royal authority. Paris in 1100, London in 1100, they're dank, weird towns. They happen to be a little bigger than other towns. <coughs> they don't look like imperial cities. Rome, of course, in 1100 is in ruins. A city of a million people that has 75,000 people. Imagine that. Pittsburgh is a city built for 600,000 with 300,000 people. And they're all whole neighborhoods that feel empty. Okay. Take another 175,000 people out of Pittsburgh. Right. What's left? Okay. Are your cities full? Are they over full? Are they half full? Okay. Permanence. You have to decide whether your culture is largely settled, semi-settled, so they move sometimes and build semi-permanent cities, or whether they're always on the move. That determines this. If they're on the move, they're still going to have things that look like cities. You just have to be able to pack them up and move them. Now again, this is not just, you know, uh, uh, Earth, right? These are cultures, maybe, you know, if you're building in a, in a fantasy setting, maybe they have some aspect of magic. They put everything in a portable hole. Boom. Instant city, just add water. That's a decision. You can have that. So, permanence matters. City ships. City ships, right. City ships on, uh, on the water. City ships in the air. Okay. I've, I've got a whole campaign, fantasy campaign, that involves trying to capture a rogue city that has been extracted out of the earth, thrown into the into the air, but it doesn't, it's not working properly, and whoever's supposed to be keeping track of it is, it's behaving erratically. Go, capture it, land it gently, right? <laughs> Families. Families and households. structure family in this country. So what does family mean? Who counts? Exactly, right? In America, we put special, special weight on the nuclear part of the family, right? A, a parenting unit their children. That's kind of the core, right? As long as that looks the way that it's supposed to look, right, that becomes the cultural idea, right? Now, other cultures will add grandparents, aunts and uncles, will make elaborate rules about gender, who gets to have what power, right? The Roman family was wildly extended, and all power flowed from the oldest male relative in that family down. Okay. We wouldn't. That would this is a little weird, a little alien, right? And yet, yeah, we're all perfectly normal, right? Um, nuclear. Extended. distant tribal obligation to each other that makes the 
role playing suddenly more interesting, right? You've got a connection you wouldn't otherwise have because you've made a decision as the GM to set that boundary at the tribal. You didn't have to. If you're not a member of an ideal family, that changes the way that you are interacted with in a small community, right? Single women, always viewed in Western cultures as unruly. Single men, even more so. It was illegal to live as a single man in Massachusetts up until past the revolution. If you allow a man to live single, when are they going to go to church? They're not going to do anything they're supposed to do. They're going to do things they're not supposed to do. You need someone with authority over this single man to get them to do the right thing. Okay? We view that as crazy talk. In Massachusetts, in 1710, the idea that a man could live alone, crazy. And women living alone, Which, which, maybe, better watch her closely, because, right, very dangerous. So think about what the ideal is and what happens if a character comes out of that cultural context not being part of the ideal. Okay? Very different relationship to the culture than otherwise would be. You have to understand what marriage looks like. Even if no one's married, what does it look like to try to get someone to marry you? There's only 10 billion stories about this, right? And it's all over fantasy literature and every other kind of literature. What does it mean to be married? Are you allowed to get divorced? What does it mean if you date someone who's divorced? What does it mean if you think you're divorced and the state doesn't think you're divorced? Do you have a church? Do they care about this kind of thing? Churches generally do. We live in the age of romantic marriage. For love. But romantic marriage, marriage for love, totally anomalous in, his, in human history. Mostly it's marriage is uh, economic or political, right? You, my daughter, will marry this person who is 63 years old and ugly. I know. But it doesn't matter because I need you to marry this person so that we can have peace and harmony in our society. So that's what's going to happen. But Father, I don't, it doesn't matter what you want. You're a pawn, do as you're told. Now, we would find that not to our preference. Yeah, it's perfectly normal. Marriage that's just economic. Oh, if I came to love my wife after 30 years. Oh, well, good for you. Mostly that doesn't happen. Mostly you gut it out. So, do you elect people marry for love? You know all these stories, these fairy stories of women growing their hair long, stuck up in towers, Rapunzel. You know what I'm talking about? Rapunzel, good old Rapunzel, right? That's all this. Oh, you want to marry someone for love? Well, I'll just lock you in a tower. Eventually you'll come around. And again, your characters never ever need to get married. But you have to know how this works. Does no one ever get married? Marriage is unknown. Interesting. How would you ever legitimate a child? How does property get inherited? You better have an answer. Physical, spiritual 
creatures. We do our own thing. Other cultures look at us and think, very strange. Why would you, why would you bury a body? That doesn't make any sense. You should take it up onto a hill and expose it so the birds will eat it. That's the correct way to dispose of the dead. What are you talking about? You allow crows to eat your grandmother? Sure. How else would you do it? Right? But you can imagine, now you're in a tavern. You had a different conversation, right? You're trying to convince someone in a culture that isn't yours to do something. Well, maybe you could get them like this. Think about how teenagers are treated in your culture. How do they know when they're not teenagers anymore? What makes them adults? Some cultures have highly elaborate rituals that mark the transition. Others have hardly any. We're a hardly any now in the United States. How do you know that you have transitioned from, from adolescence to adulthood in the United States? Just numbers. What else? Anything that those numbers connect to? Right. The secession of mandatory education at age 18. Graduation. Yeah, ability to vote or to be drafted, maybe, right? Right, anything, yeah, exactly. What's limited? Okay, and you can, you can write that into your own culture, right? You're not allowed to do X until you have passed this ritual stage. Okay? You can have a whole campaign of 14-year-old people trying to pass through a series of rituals on their way to adulthood. Right? You could play that game in any setting for a year. It'd be pretty cool. Right? Set up what the challenges are. Okay? There are really challenges in this country. Learn how to drive. It's not that hard. Right? So, Fraternities, affiliations, 
sort of Elks clubs, Kiwanis, Knights of Columbus, those kind of clubs in, in a modern American context are community service. They're service oriented. So they're fraternal in the sense of bringing people who are nominally of like mind together. They're primarily in applied service. And Americans are, as Western cultures go, Americans are the most community service oriented Western culture. We give way more of our time to uh, non-church organizations than any other Western culture does. So we form these kind of organizations like they're going inside. And obligation, in this case, the other Obligation means if you and I are both in a an organization together, if we're kin intellectually or by blood, what do I have to do if you ask for my help? You should know that, right? If um, you know Tracy works at my school, I work at Tracy's school, right? We have a we have an association bond. What is it? Does it impose anything on us? Not really. But I feel obligated to help you in a way that I wouldn't feel obligated necessarily to help someone in Shadyside. Right? Because we have that, that kind of tie. That's what obligation is. Okay? How tight is that? Right? Is it imposed or is it just uh, something you feel? talking about Frodo and Sam? That's rank. Do you have it? Every society has it, nearly. Are the ranks named and clear? Duke, Duchess, Baron, Baronet, Lord, my Lord, Sir, right? Or is it just sort of understood? You feel it out. You've got the sense of it. Mobility. Every society, no matter how ranked it is, lets you move. Lady Diana Spencer, before she became Princess Diana, she was in the ranking system kind of low, okay, to marry the would-be. She's the mother of the man who will be king, and she was just a lady. That's a level of mobility that doesn't really exist in many cultures, and yet there is, right? Had she lived, she herself would have been queen from a very low position, right? Of course, if your society has high levels of mobility, that gives a player character a really neat hook. I aspire to this. I was this. I was this and now I'm this. I was busted down, right? Or whatever. And what, what, what gets you that mobility? In this case, it was... Well, what? She's beautiful. That helps. Doesn't it always help? Right? Charisma? <laughs> if you're going to use the crass D&D term, right? And uh, into the family. And it was 15 years of utter, utter personal misery for this poor woman, right? Almost every minute of her life, from the moment she ascended from where she was, a lowly kindergarten teacher, right? To be Princess Diana, known across the world, every Diana time is horrible. She suffered while being rich and famous. Societies, if you've watched Downton Abbey or any of those sort of British costume dramas, you know how this works, right? This is so British, you can't stand it, but right? it's very painful. And every society has it, including ours. Okay. <clears throat> This is uh, the hanging of witches in New England. What does your culture view as orderly or disorderly? How does it maintain what's orderly and punish what's disorderly? 
then there's this idea of what are the ordering institutions? Who decides what orderly is? Who gives the orders to those institutions to keep things in order? Sphere how broadly conceived is the power of an ordering institution? What are some ordering institutions in American life? Police. School, big time. Government, right? CIA. Right? The spy masters, right? The Ministry of Love, right? 1984 Orwell, right? I have to torture you because otherwise you just won't be thinking straight. Right? I have to torture your body to save your soul. Look at the behavior of the North Carolina legislature, the Mississippi legislature, in recent days. The Georgia bill. They they are government is an ordering institution. These states are saying we do not want these social changes that are being brought from some court that doesn't share our values in some faraway city, right? We have our own values and we want them to be preserved, okay? That's why when you read old laws, you never quite know what they're about. Are they actually trying to fix a problem or do they just represent the anxiety of a lawmaker at the time? I am gonna keep legislating on this thing until it stops, right? Stop doing what I just told you to stop doing. And if you don't stop, Next year, I will ask you again, please stop doing what you're doing, right? But you're totally right. Okay. Now, in this case, you had special witchcraft courts set up in New England. The church was unbelievably powerful, okay? You look just a little different. Talk just a little different. Come to town from the wrong other town, and everyone's on you, right? And they're all over you. Okay, until either you conform or you're broken. Okay. Think about uh, the Inquisition. Okay. Catholic attempt to save you from Protestantism. It's all part of the same, right? Think about how powerful or not powerful your ordering institutions are. Imagine someone violating a rule that an ordering institution cares about in your society. They don't even know it. PCs have come from, the, from outside. They've done something somewhere that someone doesn't like. Now you've got a whole series of NPCs who are feverishly acting against your PCs, and they don't even know. The, uh, this, this is my favorite, right? The PCs touch something they should not have touched. They don't even know. And they're still touching things. And other people are starting to gather their strength. Then you attack them, and they don't even know why they've been attacked. <laughs> That's the best. Why did that person just do that? They were pretty bad. Okay. Now, order and authority are different. Why does the North Carolina legislature have the authority to issue ordering instructions? You see the difference? How much power do we allow an ordering institution, or a government, or a judge, a mayor, right? How much power do we give up? Okay. How do those things relate? How much power is retained by the individual? How much does the individual give away to the collective? Is there political participation? Does anyone vote on anything? Famous Monty Python sketch. Old woman. Man. Didn't know you were calm, Dennis. You didn't bother to find out, did you? We're in an anarcho-syndicalist commune. Who lives in that castle? No one lives there. 
Who's your Lord? We don't have a Lord. What? You know, we act as sort of an executive, you know, those kind of nonsense. Right? Where does power start? How does it flow? Who has it? Who doesn't? It? How do they get it? How do they keep it? How do you lose it? you got to think about these things. Freedom.
in this city, simply take your car, drive it to this neighborhood, and drive around. There's no money there now. There hasn't been for 50 years. Because there's no reason to invest because people bailed out. Right? That's where all the crime was. It, did, it wasn't true in 1945. It was poor and black, but it wasn't, a, you know, a, a particularly criminal. And yet, that simple decision, right? So think about how wealth is distributed in your society that you're building. It makes a lot of difference if it's distributed really unevenly or if it's distributed in a flat way. Flat distribution requires very powerful ordering institutions to take money away from rich people. Rich people don't want their money taken away. Go back into history, ancient cultures that try to do this. Think if you want to get a real sense of how this, look up two brothers, the Gracchi in ancient Rome, G-R-A-C-C-H-I. Uh, or look up Athenian land reform in the 500s BC. Ancient rich people do not want their land and their money taken away. Okay. And it almost never happens that it gets taken away. But you can decide it in your society. Everyone's equal. You come into the society and you're recognized as a member of the society. You're given a house, a salary, and the expectation to find meaningful work. What am I doing? Where am I? Right? That would be weird. Or, vice versa, think about it. What does your culture value about work? Is it hardworking or not? More leisurely, more worker, more, more working. Would your society put a 10-year-old to work in a mine or not? This society did. Critical question about work. Does your society keep slaves or not? This doesn't have to be American race-based chattel slavery. It could just be, you know, your 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 uh, your navy had an exceptionally good year and took five thousand people um, off of enemy boats and put them in put them in chains. If your society does that, if it doesn't, what does it do with those people? Does it put them to death? Does it ransom them back? I mean, whatever it does, it does, right? Slavery changes what work means to people who aren't slaves. If you let a slave do something, a free person doesn't want to do it. So you have to really decide that first. If your society keeps slaves, it changes all the other definitions of overworkings. Keep in mind, in a pre, in an industrial or pre-industrial society, everyone worked from age five. It's not like this is some big deal, right? For 5,000 years of human history, it's only been a big deal since the 1930s. Laws that said, no, you cannot employ a seven-year-old in a mine 14 hours a day. That's 1930s. What does your culture do for fun? If it, if it values fun, maybe it doesn't. Some cultures don't. They're just very work-oriented, right? Um, I, I think about this in sort of two or three different ways. Sports, nearly every culture has a sporting tradition. What does that look like? Individual team, you know, what do they like to play? They have bowlers, right? And then diversions are things like gardening, needlepoint, right? I once designed a culture um, of sort of half-orc-like people um, who um, competed across their society um, in, um, uh, in gardening. So they were really hyper attentive to their land and to making lovely gardens. So they would go, there would be this travel season throughout the year where different clubs would go from town to town to town to look at the gardens. That had been What's wrong with that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Why is it that the United States is the most indifferent culture in the world to football, to soccer? Why don't we like it as much? We like 
other things. Why? Why do the Chinese love table tennis? What makes judo the uh, Korean thing? Why? There are reasons. Think about it. The moment, and you can get the great thing about for me when I'm designing cultures based on this strategy: pick anything, start anywhere, and then it'll start. Every, it will populate the other fields. Okay. This is a culture that loves rugby. Okay. So they, they, are, they have a high tolerance to violence, which means their ordering institutions are probably violent. Right? They, they're pretty collaborative. Super competitive, though. Right? Do they let women play? You have to make that decision. Women and men play together. Play separately. Does that matter? It kind of does. Decide. Okay, that helps to answer the gender question. A culture that, that lets men and women play rugby together is not going to have hang-ups about gender that other cultures do. Good? Yes, thank you. Okay. How do people dress? This is Princess Beatrice and her famous hat. Princess on the right, Princess Beatrice's hat. You can look it up. Most preposterous hat I've ever seen. She was going to a wedding. Who would do this? Only people who dress according to elaborate, ritualized patterns that denote status. Regular people don't dress this way. In the United States, we all sort of dress alike. There's a man's way of dressing that sort of informal, which is to say what farmers and, and people who work in factories would dress like. And then more formal. That would be the bosses. You're the most formal. You got the tie on, right? Fashion's most absurd piece of adornment, right? I wear one every day. It's crazy, right? You've got the jacket on, but no tie, right? Your farmer, you've got the farmer hat on, farmer, 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 right? We're all dressed like farmers and industrialists, right? I don't have the tie on, so clearly you're the one in charge. You've got the tie on it, you've got the fancy ring, right? So, and the computer, obviously. The person in charge, right? I get a pass because I have white hair. And in this culture, then, I mean it, right? I get a pass on all kinds of things. I am assumed to be in charge because I have white hair. So what does dress say about stats? Say anything. Think about it. Yummy. What do your people eat? Would they eat goose? That's a goose. Would they eat animals? Or are they vegetarians? Fish only? Every culture is different. What does your culture eat when it's famine time? Every culture has its food traditions, and it's things that you uniquely denote its culture, okay? Give me an example of a culture and its food that uniquely describes them. Judaism. Say again? Judaism. And? Um, what they eat and what they don't eat. Right, right. So, matzah and Passover, we're in. Shrimp, always trafe, right? Always no, right? Uh, Hindus, cows, always off limits, right? The French, snails, lovely, right? The Danes, snails, you lost your mind, right? Right, 